Hey everybody, today we're gonna talk about Death Note. The title of this video, How Death Note Got Bad, is pretty incendiary and maybe not the perfect way to describe my complicated and nuanced feelings about the show. I've seen Death Note like five times. I love it a lot and I would easily call it one of my favorite TV shows. But across its runtime, I love it in very different ways. Starting up the show, no matter how many times I've seen it, I'm always blown away by how great and well written it is. But but after that, fairly quickly after that as we're gonna see, it becomes fun, useless garbage. I love Death Note, I love Warm Trash TV, but when I look at the show, I can't help but see a lot of wasted potential. And in this video, I want to explore when and how that potential was wasted. It should be fun, I think. I'm excited for this fun, chill video. Part 1. Why Death Note Slaps I've actually already made a video a pretty long time ago where I talked about why I like Death Note. And while I still agree with some of the points I made there, that video is kind of vague and just not good. Most games are defined by a predictable set of mechanics that the player comes to understand over the course of play. When you play Mario, you are offered a set of inputs and obstacles. Besides, I think it's necessary to this video to explain in some depth why I love the early episodes of Death Note so much. So to do that, let's start by looking at one of the most iconic scenes in the show, where Light Yagami and L play tennis. Let me set the stakes. Light Yagami is a sexy hot boy genius who gets a notebook from a god of death, a Shinigami, that allows him to kill people if he writes their name in it. So he decides he's gonna kill all the criminals and become the god of this new world. I will become the god of this new world. L is the hot sexy detective trying to track down Kira, the person committing these murders. And in this scene, one of the first times the two characters meet, they decide to play some tennis. But when you first invited me to play, did you know how good I was? Yes, I'll be fine though. It's been a while, but at one time I was actually the British Junior Champion. L already suspects that Light might be Kira, but of course he's not sure. And as we watch the scene, we enter the internal monologue of Light, as he deliberates over the meaning of this game. If he wins, will L suspect him more? What if he lets himself lose? Is he going to think that I'm Kira if I go for the win? I suppose I could just lose on purpose, but if I do, it could work against me. Since he'd expect Kira to want to win, he might also expect me to throw the match to avoid suspicion. But toward the middle of this scene, Light realizes L's not going to be able to deduce anything from this. Him winning or losing will, at the end of the day, be meaningless. I don't see any way that he can profile me based on a tennis match. So... I have to assume he has some other goal in mind. So, looking at this, we might have a question. If these lines don't move the plot forward, don't tell us anything of importance, then why are we listening to them? What's the point? And the answer to that question, from my perspective, is simple. The point is, it's a tennis game. Sure, we might understand in retrospect that this is a dead end, but we can't know that until we think it through. And in this way, Death Note says something kinda profound. That within its logic, objects do not merely exist as a way to keep the narrative flowing, to get the characters where they need to go. Rather, they just are what they are, and the characters have to deal with them. We are playing a game of tennis. What does tennis mean? We can see this philosophy pervade the early episodes of Death Note, this sense that objects have an existence of their own. What if Light gets a call at an extremely inopportune moment? How can he prevent that? Oh no, what if my father calls back now? I already promised her that I'd let her talk to him if he did. If this phone rings, it's all over for me. What am I gonna do? Well, obviously, he just has to turn his phone off. This is crazy. All I have to do is turn my cell phone off. This isn't difficult or complicated, and if Light simply had never gotten a call, most people in the audience would never have noticed. But nevertheless, we're directed to think about this phone for the simple reason that it exists and might go off. It's just that simple. What if someone in Light's family just happened upon the death note while they were in his room? Well, that's not something I ever expected to happen, and if no character had brought it up, I wouldn't give it a second thought. 
but we do think about it. In fact, a substantial part of an episode is devoted to Light figuring out the best and most elaborate way to hide the thing. But that's not all. Uh -huh. Even if someone figures out that there's a fake base, I've set things up so that there's no way they could get their hands on the notebook. You see, once the ink reservoir is inserted, it acts as an insulator, preventing the flow of electricity around the circuit. This never comes up again. It doesn't go anywhere. But we hear about it anyway, because it's something that Light would have to think about. Can the Death Note make people do impossible stuff before they die? Well, no, it can't do that. And obviously it can't. If Light could just give people superpowers with the Death Note, the entire show would be over in like two episodes. And yet, we still have to go through the process of learning how this object works, what it can and can't do. It's impossible to make someone write what they don't already know. Or, at the very least, it has to be the kind of thing that they could come up with on their own. Basically, even the Death Note can't do the impossible. And through this sensibility, this constant attention to the functioning of objects, the show produces a sense of genuine wonder and intrigue. Look, Death Note is a work of fiction, and as such, we know on some level that what's gonna happen, whether Light will win or not, is mostly a matter of what will serve the plot, what the writers wanted to see happen. But in these moments where we learn random, useless information, it doesn't feel like it's just a story, like its events are just beats in a big narrative. Rather, the world of Death Note feels real. Not because it's down to earth or subdued, it's not those things, but because we are constantly forced to observe it with the knowledge that anything could be meaningful. Light could lose because his sister found the Death Note, because he didn't experiment enough with how the notebook works, because his phone rang, because he didn't think through a game of tennis. It's all important. It's all on the table. And I just wish it could have stayed that way. Part 2. Misa Amane Okay, let's put a pin in all this stuff. We'll come back to it later. But for now, I want to introduce you to probably the most infamous character in Death Note. Misa Amane. In the 10th episode of Death Note, Misa Amane enters the picture. Through a strange coincidence that we won't get into here, she comes into the ownership of another Death Note from a Shinigami named Rem. She's a huge Kira supporter, so she decides to use her power to track him down. And when she meets him, meets Light, she immediately falls in love. Would you please make me your girlfriend? So, just on a very visceral gut level, I think Misa is one of the most horrendously annoying characters I've ever seen, and I hate her with my full throbbing ass. There are only three facts that are really important or true about Misa's character. First, she's a total simp for Light, easily manipulated by him, willing to do whatever he says, and totally defined through her relationship to him. I can't be your boyfriend, but I can act like it. Thank you so much. Second, she's unbearably annoying in every scene she's in, constantly shouting, never understanding what's going on, etc. Whatever, it's not believable because I'm not the second kid, okay? <laughs> Third, as the show likes to remind us, she's a hot and sexy woman. Come on, fellas, Death Note says. I bet you wouldn't mind having a little bit of Misa Amane in your life. Not bad at all. There's really nothing else to her besides these three things. In general, the show makes sure to make her depiction as pandering, fan y and vapid as possible. Hey Light, wanna come sleep with me tonight? What are you talking about? <laughs> Just kidding! You're saving it for after we catch Kira, right? You don't have to be shy about it. And I find watching her to be a chore. You can disagree with that, of course, but I won't understand you, or how that's even possible, honestly. But more than just me not liking Misa, what I find troublesome about her character is the way she changes the structure of Death Note. To put it simply, Misa represents an enormous bomb to the plot of the show. What she lacks in character depth or interest, she makes up for with the number of elements she adds to the story. Misa is a reckless idiot, so she's at far greater risk than Light is for being caught for something trivial. Misa has the ability to kill people without knowing their name, and since she's endlessly devoted to Light, he can use her to achieve his ends. Misa's Shinigami Rem is, in turn, endlessly 
mostly devoted to her. We'll kill Light if Misa dies. If you do anything that results in this girl's death, the first thing I'll do is write your name in my death note. I will kill you. Is fully willing to kill herself if it would help her. So in every way, Misa adds complexity and unpredictability to the plot of Death Note. The feeling that we legitimately don't know what's going to happen next because this character has screwed up everything for everyone. And while that choice could totally work for a different story, I don't think it does for this one. And that's because Death Note thrives off a sense of simplicity and intimacy. Looking back at the tennis scene I already talked about, we can see how comprehensible the stakes are here. Elle suspects that Light's Kira, Light wants to figure out what Elle's thinking, and that's it. Everything that's happening, everything that's gonna move the plot forward, is right here on the tennis court, in this interaction between these two minds. And because of that, the show is forced to engage with every bit of information it can. Is there a way for Elle to figure out Light's Kira based on this game? How could he do that? What's the point of this? While it's true that Kira hates losing, it's also true that most people would rather win than lose. It's human nature. We we have to look at these things for the simple reason that there is nothing else to look at. No other way for L or Light to get the upper hand. And in some sense then, we can understand Misa Amane as an escape hatch. The embodied desire to break the stalemate between L and Light. Misa is a big annoying disruption, and we can't depend on her acting rationally, and there are a million things about her that could change the tide of this conflict. Misa Amane rips the show away from comfortable stability and forces its characters to make big moves and play to win. And as it turns out, through that process, the show loses a lot of the intimacy, specificity, and tension that made it great. Part 3 how Death Note Stopped Slapping So far in this video, I've stayed pretty general and haven't talked that much about the plot. But for obvious reasons, I have to get into that stuff. So what I'm gonna do now is a quick and dirty recap, taking us to episode 25 of the show. God help me, I hate summarizing things so much. Also, if you haven't seen Death Note, now might be a good time to stop if you want to watch the show. I haven't spoiled much of anything so far, and I'm about to spoil everything. So without further ado... In the 15th episode of the show, Misa Amane is apprehended by Elle and the police for being involved in the Kira crimes. We've taken her into custody under suspicion of being the second Kira. This happens because she literally leaves fingerprints on some Kira tape she sent in. It's really dumb and random, but whatever, that's not important. After that, Elle says that Light is now the primary suspect in the Kira investigation. So, Light has to act fast and hatch a big, complicated scheme. First, he goes into prison under constant surveillance by L. From there, he relinquishes his ownership of the Death Note over to Rem, thereby removing all his memories of being Kira. Listen. Just hear me out. I swear to you, I'm not lying. You have to believe me. Now, Rem gives the notebook to a greedy businessman, Higuchi, who will continue killing while Light is in prison. This helps to exonerate him. With no evidence to go on, L is forced to release the memoryless Light, and they track down this new Kira together while both Light and Misa continue to be under constant surveillance. This leads to some pretty wacky situations. Even if I leave you two alone, I'm still going to be watching on surveillance cameras, so it wouldn't make any difference. You pervert! Catching this new Kira takes seven full episodes, but once they finally do that, Light touches the notebook again, restoring his memory. And, to add insult to injury, while Light was in detention, he had his Shinigami Ryuk write a bunch of fake rules. The most important of which is that if you don't write a name in the notebook for 13 consecutive days, you die. If this rule were true, it would be impossible for Light to be Kira, since he was in jail for far longer than 13 days. Light and Misa were detained for more than 50 days and are still under surveillance. If either of them had been Kira, there's no way they would still be alive by now. So, L lets Misa Amane go and takes the handcuffs off of Light. Now, all the pieces are in place. Misa goes off to the woods to touch the notebook, and since she once saw L's name, she can write it. But wait, that doesn't work. After so long, Misa forgot L's real name. It's no good. 
I don't remember his name anymore. But as it turns out, that's that's fine. That's all right. Because before Al can figure out that the 13 day rule is fake, Light gets Misa's Shinigami, Rem, to kill L for him. She does this because now that Misa's committing murder with the notebook again, L would be sure to catch her. And as I already said, Rem just loves Misa Amane so hard. Also, this causes Rem to die because the way a Shinigami dies is by extending the life of a human they love. <sighs> so that's it. That's how L dies. And honestly, saying it all together like that, it sounds pretty cool. All these intricate, complicated rules working together to make for a grand strategy, it sounds like Death Note. And I can't deny that the first times I saw the show, I thought it was pretty rad when everything came together and Light got the win. I've won. Exactly as planned. But what I want to explain to you here is why I think all of this kinda sucks, actually, and doesn't really work. First of all, the way L acts here is completely illogical, isn't it? He knows, like actually knows, that Misa Amane was involved in the Kira crimes. He says so himself. Amane will remain under surveillance until Kira is apprehended. Although she insists the tapes we found were just occult videos, the physical evidence we have plus her confession suggest otherwise. He suspected all along that once they caught this new Kira, the power he was using would return to light. Miyazaki still believes that I'm Kira. Even if that power had been passed to someone else, he thinks that I would have planned to have it returned to me once I'm safe from suspicion. What's more, having now touched the note, El has the ability to understand exactly how Light would have transferred his powers this way. Because of this, El immediately suspects that the 13-day rule is false and is prepared to test it out. We're very close. If we work this out, the entire case will be solved. And yet, even with all of these deductions, all of this information, El is just like, you're free to go, Misa. Have fun. Go to the weird forest with the other Death Note. Light, you don't need to be handcuffed to me anymore. Just have fun. You're finally free to leave headquarters on your own, but it seems like you never go out. Why? Why does he allow this situation to happen? Why doesn't he continue to surveil both of them constantly? And look, I know this looks like a Cinema Sins ding ding moment. And yeah, it actually is one. But Death Note is a show that's particularly averse to having problems like this. L is supposed to be a genius, right? So watching him make this obvious, lethal mistake, one that is given no justification by the plot whatsoever, brings us out of the fiction of Death Note. Note. But the problem here runs way deeper than just the show breaking its sense of immersion with a plot hole. And to explain why that is, let's go back a little bit earlier in the show. The first time Light and Misa meet, the 14th episode, Light asks Rem if she'll just kill L for him. Could you ask Rem to kill L? Huh? Rem said that your happiness was important, but what do you think would happen if El caught one of us? It means our happiness would be ruined. And shockingly, Rem says yes. Fine. As you wish, Light Yagami, but I do not like you. This is a strange scene, I think, because it forces us to ask a question. What would we think if that moment was essentially the end of the show? After this conversation, Rem just goes off, finds L, and kills him. Light wins. Would we be happy with that conclusion? Well, obviously not. That would be completely arbitrary as an ending. A cop-out, plain and simple, totally unimaginative and unimpressive. But here's the thing, that's almost exactly what happens. The reason why Rem doesn't end up killing L soon after this conversation is that L narrowly avoids it, tells Light that if he should die in the next few days, he's instructed the police to assume that Light is Kira. In the unlikely event that I die in the next few days, I've instructed your father and everyone at headquarters to assume that you are Kira. And then, moments later, Misa is apprehended by the cops and the whole big scheme we've already talked about sets in. But 
when we come to the end of this scheme, when Light finally does get Rem to kill L, what's actually changed? At this point, L has all the reason in the world to say that if he dies soon, L and Light are both Kiras. In fact, he has more reason than he did the first time, since he now knows how the Death Note works and immediately comes to the conclusion that the 13-day rule is bullshit. See, for all of the complexity of Light's plan, it's just not a very good plan. For all intents and purposes, it ends exactly where it begins, with Light and L in the same situation. So, we have to ask, why have this plan at all then? What does it actually accomplish? And the only answer I can give here is that it creates a situation where Light getting a literal god of death to kill L looks like a substantial ending. If we add enough little complexities and weird mechanics to the show, if we spend seven whole boring episodes focusing on catching this random idiot, then maybe the audience will believe us when we say, this ending has been earned. It's very cool that Light was able to pull this off. But it's not cool. It doesn't take a genius to ask a god of death to kill somebody. It's not impressive the first time, and it's not impressive ten episodes later. And looking at all of this, I can't help but feel like it's the exact opposite of what made Death Note great in the first place. As I said earlier, what made Death Note work so well was its feeling of substance. This contract between the show and the audience that things matter. The phone in Light's pocket, the rules of the Death Note, the tennis game he plays. But now, by the time L dies, nothing matters at all. The show is just an endless parade of big bells and whistles. What's Misa Amane up to? How can we use her and her Shinigami to put an end to this plot? Isn't this plan extremely extra and convoluted? That must mean that it's super smart somehow. In a very real sense, the early episodes of Death Note were about paying attention to everything. And every episode between Misa's first meeting with Light and L's death are about ignoring as much as possible. Part 4. Conclusion So, there are episodes after L dies. I mean, there are 12 of them. It's a pretty substantial part of Death Note. But honestly, I'm pretty apathetic. I could talk about how near L's main successor kind of sucks and bores me, or I could talk about how it annoys me how invested the show becomes in watching Light manipulate women. Like, when it's just Misa, it's tolerable, but once Light's also manipulating Kiyomi Takeda, eventually forcing her to die in a way that's clearly meant to be erotic for the audience, it becomes clear that the show just has an unquenchable woman problem. I could also talk about how I like Teru Mikami. I think he's a fun weirdo, is my take about Teru. But in the end, I don't think it's worth the time to get too into any of those things. The fact is, the beating heart of Death Note is the relationship and conflict between Light and L. And after the show fails so spectacularly at creating a satisfying resolution to that plot, I just can't bring myself to be invested in what happens next. Will Nier win? Will Light take the day? Who Who's to say, but also I don't really care. And, you know, maybe that's the right way to think about Death Note in general, both before and after L dies. Death Note is a trashy show, after all, from minute one to minute done. It's about a little edgelord baby who talks about being a god a lot. It's so incredibly self-serious with its constant references to the Bible. Ryuk has a cute little earring, so everyone can tell that he's a goth GF and he doesn't give a fuck what you think about him. He just loves his man, and like, death and stuff. So yeah, maybe I'm taking all of this a bit too seriously. And I can say that and think there's truth in it, but I can't force myself to feel that way. I know it might sound silly, but the best parts of Death Note are so great so precise and clever and grounded. It just scratches this very particular itch that makes it feel like if I want to see something like Death Note, I just have to watch Death Note again. 
The last time I watched the show, it was with my own goth GF who hadn't seen it. And honestly, I did enjoy the whole thing, like I enjoy comfort food. And I liked watching it through another person's eyes. But I will say this. As we were watching the early episodes of the show, it wasn't uncommon at all for me to audibly gasp at how cool it was. I'd even rewind pretty frequently so we could rewatch scenes. I'm very annoying to watch TV with, if you couldn't tell. But after those first 10 or so episodes, I wasn't gasping anymore. So that's the video. Uh, did you like it? Did you agree with it? Did, did you think I gave Death Note a fair shake? Or do you think that I was being unfair and that Death Note's actually better than I was saying? Well, be sure to leave your opinion down in the comment section below. Say, Big Joel, you made a great video just then. Hell yeah, Death Note gets a lot worse. Or say, no, Big Joel, you don't understand at all. Big Joel, Big Joel. <laughs> Uh, okay, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, uh, give me money on Patreon if you want to. And now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Erica asks, who are some of your favorite directors? I'll just name a few directors that come to mind right now. Uh, Hayao Miyazaki's gotta be one of my favorite directors ever. And with that, I've actually been getting way more into Isao Takahata lately. Like, I don't know what it is. He, he manages to rival Miyazaki in terms of quality while making movies that are just way worse. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, maybe I'm just on a high from watching Princess Kaguya, honestly. Then, of course, I love Akira Kurosawa, Martin Scorsese. I think that Taxi Driver and Raging Bull are some of the best movies ever made, as well as Mean Streets. And then, um, you know, Don Hertzfeld, his masterpiece, It's Such a Beautiful Day, might be like easily top five favorite movies I've ever seen. So that's some of my favorite directors. Um, cool. Uh, that's the end of the video now, for real this time. Bye.